you will be, uh, yeah, leading us through this. So I thank you so much. Um, who are you? What do you do? <laughs> Why are you here? Uh, How do you know us? Yes. So I'm Dan. I teach New Testament and Greek at Trinity Theological College in Leadable. Uh, and so I was invited to come and preach this week because uh, North Coast Church is a great partner of our college. We've got lots of students like Cam and others who come and study with us. Uh, and so, yeah, I get to have the privilege of coming and opening God's Word with you this morning. Wow, we really, really thank you for that. Hey, um, why are you a Bible college lecturer? Why do you want to do that with your life? Surely there's so many other things you could be doing. Why, why this? Yeah, so uh, I think because that's what God wants me to do is the short answer. Um, yeah, and I love doing it. So uh, there is such a need in our churches for people who are trained to do ministry, who are uh, equipped to be able to handle the Word of God uh, and to teach others to handle the Word of God. Uh, we've all got good intuitions if we've been around church for a while about how to read the Bible and perhaps read it with other people. Uh, but I like to illustrate it. It's like if you're kind of two-finger typing, you can type fairly quickly if you can do that. That's what my mum and my dad do when they type. Um, that's what I do. That's, that's, why, that's why my assignments <laughs> are all late, right? There we go. Um, but kind of receiving some training in how to read the Bible is like learning to touch type. It can be very painful at first. You might want to throw your computer across the room. Uh, you might feel like you, you used to be able to do this thing and now you can't. But in the end, uh, it just it really helps. And so that's what I do with my time and I love doing it. Uh, yeah, all the time. Oh. Hey, um, a lot of people in our church have been uh, involved in Trinity, uh, some as full-time students, some as part-time, yep. others who have done uh, Trinity at night. So yes. as, I, as, I, as I exit stage, is that stage left or right? As I exit stage that way, um, would you tell us about uh, Trinity at night coming up this term? Because you will be taking one of those classes. Yep. Can you let us know about that sure. as I disappear? So Trinity at Night, we offer a whole bunch of different uh, courses that people can do. Trinity at Night is the one for if you want to come and you want to come to Trinity because you want to know God better. Uh, so if you want to come to Trinity in order to uh, lead a Bible study, to lead a church, those sort of things, come and talk to me. I'd love to talk to you about our options. But if you kind of go, I really just want to know God better. I want to kind of spend a good two hours deep in His Word. Then Trinity at Night is for you. It runs on a Tuesday and a Thursday night in February and March and does so every term. Uh, this term, on Tuesday night, we've got youth ministry uh, with uh, Crew West, a guy from Crew West, Ed, is fantastic, and I'll be taking Thursday nights on 1 Corinthians. They're both based down in Leaderville at the college. If you'd like to know more, I have some uh, very brightly coloured flyers that I, you can come and grab from me, and I'd love to talk further with you about that. Uh, but, uh, now we come, and we're going to think about this passage together. Uh, so please, if you have your Bibles, open them to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, it'll also be up on the screen. I'm going to read this for us together. Hear what God says through the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love... I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have the faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all that I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection is in a mirror. Then we will see face to face. Now, I know in part, 
then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your amazing love to us. We thank you that we don't deserve anything from your hand, but that you graciously give us all things nonetheless. Father, as we come and we look at this passage together now, we pray that you, by your spirit, would open this word. Speak to us as you have promised to do. And please open our hearts and take this word, plant it deep in there, so that we might know and love and serve and trust you with everything that we have. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, uh, this passage of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, I've preached on it over 50 times. I haven't preached this sermon 50 times, don't worry, but I have preached on this passage over 50 times. And that's because of the kind of church that I used to work in. You see, the kind of church I used to work in doesn't look anything like the building that we're in now. It looks like this, hopefully. There we go, one more. This is what the church that I worked in looks like. If you've ever seen uh, the Australian film Muriel's Wedding, this is the building that they filmed Muriel's Wedding in. It was built in 1856. It's made of sandstone, so when it gets hot, the sandstone just like emanates heat the entire summer. It's really not designed for Australian conditions whatsoever, but it looks very pretty. And so lots of people would want to come and have their wedding in this building. Now, most of the people that wanted to come and have their wedding in this building had no connection with us as a church. In fact, almost all of them had no connection with uh, any church anywhere, and yet this is the kind of wedding that they wanted. So they'd come and they'd ask us and they'd say, we want to come and get married in your building and we'd say okay here's what you need to do you need to come and do a course with us we'll explain the gospel to you using marriage to help explain the, the gospel because as we know in Ephesians 5 uh, we're told that marriage is a wonderful picture of what Christ does for the church as he gives up his life for it so we would do that uh, and then we'd have the wedding service itself and as part of the wedding service uh, the couple had to have a bible reading uh, and then I would uh, speak on that Bible passage. Uh, in the, the year that I took a lot of weddings, I had 50 weddings in that year. 48 of them chose this passage of 1 Corinthians. If they didn't know any better, they, just, they knew that this was in the Bible and this is what they chose. And so 48 times I preached on this passage. But there's one that sticks out in my memory. One time that I preached on this sermon, it was a, uh, this passage, it was a hot December day. Middle of the afternoon, the sun is beating down, it's in Sydney, so when you walk out the door, you're hit by a wall of humid air. It was oppressive, right? The, the sandstone is glowing by this point, it's been heating up for days. I'm there in my suit, standing on the pavement, waiting for the bridal party. We'd had a practice a few nights before, uh, and I'd asked them what time they were going to leave, where they were coming from, and they told me, and I said, you need to leave sooner. You're not going to make it here on time. Now, of all the weddings that I did that year, none of them were more than 10 minutes late except for this wedding. This bridal party arrived 70 minutes late. And then the bloke who was driving the flower girls got lost and arrived another 15 minutes after that, right? 90 minutes, I was standing in the sun, in my suit, in the heat, in the humidity, waiting for this wedding. As you can imagine, I was ropeable. I was completely frustrated. And then one of the bridesmaids, uh, when they finally turned up, gets out of the car and has a go at me for not being happy on the big day. And you can imagine what that did to my mood. And then I had to walk inside and preach on this passage. It's easy to see why people choose this passage for their weddings. In fact, it's the kind of passage that lots of Christians have up in their house somewhere, isn't it? You might even have a piece of art that, 
that says love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy and boast, it is not rude and all the rest. Everyone loves love. And why wouldn't you? Except the Corinthians. You see, this letter that Paul uh, is writing to this church in this ancient city of Corinth, they valued something much more highly than love. They valued success. That's what they wanted out of life. That's what they wanted out of business. That's what they wanted out of their family. And that's what they wanted out of their church. They wanted success. So when they came and they looked at their church, they asked, how big is it? How influential is it? How impressive is it? How successful are we as a church? This is what the Corinthians would ask. And it meant that they had, on the outside, a very impressive church. A church that you'd look at and you think, gee, God is really doing things at that church. But once you started to scratch under the surface, once you started to dig a little bit deeper, then it became very clear, very quickly, that this was a church that was completely malfunctional. So many issues going on. And that's why Paul writes this letter of 1 Corinthians. He writes to address these issues. And at the very core of what he needs to tell them is this chapter on love. And very simply, what Paul says in this chapter is this. In the church, when you serve, love surpasses everything. In the church, when you serve, love surpasses everything. And what Paul does in this chapter of 1 Corinthians 13 is he moves in three big blocks. He has three big points, and those are the points that we're going to take one by one. The first one, if you've got your Bibles open, is in uh, verses 1 to 3. And here Paul uh, says, it doesn't matter how great your spiritual gifts are, if you don't have love, you have nothing. This is what Paul says, you have love or you have nothing. You have love or you have nothing. Now, what I've done here is I've taken the first three verses of 1 Corinthians and I've put them in a table because what Paul does is he does the same thing in verse 1 and then he does it again in verse 2 and then he does it again in verse 3. He starts with a spiritual gift that he has. So if you look there at verse 1, he says, if I speak in the tongues of men, and what he means is, uh, if I can speak a language that I haven't actually formally learnt, that you know, God by his spirit is empowering me to communicate to someone that I couldn't otherwise speak to, Verse 1, verse 2, if I have prophetic powers. Verse 3, if I give everything away. These are things that Paul had, that Paul could do, that Paul did by the Spirit of God. That's the start of each of the verses. But then what Paul does in each of the verses is he kicks it up a notch. He ratchets it up. He makes it almost hyperbolic. So verse 1, he says, don't worry about human languages. What if I could speak in angel languages? Verse 2, Don't worry about prophetic powers. What if I knew everything and I had faith that could move mountains? Verse 3, don't worry about if I gave all my stuff away. What if I gave my very body away? Right, so you can see here three times, start with a spiritual gift, make it bigger. And then in each of the three verses, the same five words, but do not have love. Three times, one in each of the verses. How would you finish those ideas? Think about verse 3. If I gave all of my possessions to the poor, even if I gave my own body over to hardship and perhaps even death, and I did not have love, what would you say? I think we'd be tempted to say it'd be a waste of time. It, It would be a waste of time if I did this without love. But that's not what Paul says, is it? He doesn't focus on the action. He doesn't focus on the consequence. He focuses on himself. If I do these things but do not have love, what does he say? Verse 1, I am a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Verse 2, I am nothing. Verse 3, I gain nothing. That's very different to the way we think. If you sold all your possessions and gave them to the poor, would your motivation matter? I think most of them say no. I could give for a number of different reasons. I could give because I feel like it. I could give because I'm feeling guilty. I could give because someone's forcing me to do it at gunpoint. Wouldn't matter. People will be fed. And that's a good thing, isn't it? That's not what Paul says. 
You have love or you have nothing. In fact, verse 3, the strongest of the three of them, you gain nothing. It's a little bit odd, isn't it? What is Paul hoping to gain? Well, of course, he's hoping to gain eternal life. He's hoping to gain his inheritance from Christ of living with God. He's hoping to gain heaven. Do you hear what Paul is saying here? If Paul does these very spiritual things and he doesn't do them with love, he runs the risk of missing out on heaven. That sounds a little bit too strong, doesn't it? But Jesus says exactly the same thing. I mean, remember what he says in the Sermon on the Mount. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And Jesus says, then I will say to them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Jesus and Paul are saying exactly the same thing. You can do good things, even amazing things, and miss out on eternal life. You can do otherworldly things, things that for all intents and purposes look spiritual and not live with Christ in heaven forever. Because do you know why? Speaking in tongues is not a mark that you have the Spirit. Prophesying is not a mark that you have the Spirit. Giving away your gifts is not a mark that you have the Spirit. Serving other people in church is not a mark that you have the Spirit. Do you know what is? One thing, every Christian has it. Love. That's what Paul is saying here. You have love or you have nothing. You have love or you have nothing. You can see here, Paul is very black and white, isn't he? There's no middle ground. It's one or the other. And I hope that his extreme, his clear, his black and white position raises an important question for you. How do I know? How do I know if I have love or not? It's very easy to think, well, I can speak in tongues. I can see that. I can see that very easy. But how do I know if I have love? And this is exactly what Paul goes on to talk about. And this is our second point in verses four to seven. What does love look like? Love looks like work. Love looks like work. Now, the Corinthians who are originally receiving this letter, they spoke Greek. And their Greek language had a lot of different words for love. You might know this if you've been around a church for a while, that there are four different words, four main words that the Greek language uses for love. It was made popular in a book here uh, by C.S. Lewis. Uh, it does what it says on the cover, The Four Loves. C.S. Lewis actually isn't quite right on this one. Now, normally, C.S. Lewis is fantastic to read. This isn't the one to read if you want to think about how the word love is used in the Bible. A much better book, and if you've still got a little bit of holidays left uh, and some summer reading to go, is Don Carson's book, The Difficult Doctrine of the Love of God. It's an excellent book to lay out exactly how we know what God's love is and how uh, we live that out. What Carson shows is that these four words for love, they overlap with each other. They're not hard and fast boxes that you can stick one in and not the other. But also what he shows is that this word that Paul uses here for love, agape, is the rarest of the four words. In the rest of Greek literature, this is not the one that most people talk about when they talk about love. So when Paul comes and says, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels and I do not have agape, most of the Corinthians are going to be scratching their heads, going, I'm not quite sure what you mean, Paul. So that they need a definition about what love is. We too need a definition about what love is, but we've got the other problem in the 21st century. We have one word for love, and that means that everything gets put into the one box. Right? So like Cam said, you can love your wife, you can love a sunset, you can love a burrito, doesn't matter, one word. 
And our world is not particularly helpful here in defining what love is. So take, for example, Lin-Manuel Miranda, the man who wrote uh, the uh, musical Hamilton that you may have seen on Disney Plus if you've been watching that or if you have kids that listen to the soundtrack on repeat like mine do. Here's, what, here, here's how Lin-Manuel Miranda defines love. Love is love is love is love is love is love is love. It's not particularly helpful, is it? Because what's it saying? Well, either you know what love is and so you actually don't need a definition or each of us gets to decide what love is and so that's what it is. But that is not helpful. Our 21st century world is just as much in the dark about what love is as the first century Corinthian world was. And into that, Paul says these words. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. How do you feel as that list comes to you? It's rather intimidating, isn't it? We could spend weeks on each one of these 13 individually and still not really get to the bottom of what all of these are about. Let me just pick on one for an example. The first one there. Love is patient. Have you ever asked yourself, why does Paul start with this one? Because if I was to ask you to write a list of the kinds of things that you'd say, what is love? I very much doubt if you'd never heard this passage before that love is patient would be the first thing that you would say. But if you stop and think about it, it doesn't take too long to realize that patience is a fantastic indicator of whether you love someone or not. Because just cast your mind back over the last seven days. How many times have you lost patience with someone else? Lost patience with your spouse, lost patience with your kids, lost patience with your parents, lost patience with your siblings, lost patience with your co-workers, lost patience with your friends, lost patience with the guys who are driving like idiots down the freeway, lost patience with the people at the supermarket who aren't obeying social distancing, whatever it might be. How many times have we fallen short of this? And even in our service of God and of other people. How many times have we lost patience with those we serve? You have love or you have nothing. See, I lost patience that day. I failed that Sydney day to live up to what this passage is calling me to do. I could have preached the best sermon in the world that day and I would have been nothing because I lost patience with those people. So I stood there in the sermon and confessed that I didn't live up to what Jesus calls me to do. And that shouldn't be a surprise to you. Most of you don't know me pretty well, but uh, we all lose our patience from time to time. And so we look at this list and we should realize fairly quickly, this list isn't about Dan Cole. It doesn't describe me perfectly. And... I'll put any money on it that this list doesn't describe you perfectly either. But it does describe Jesus. If you stop and you put Jesus' name into each of these, what happens? Jesus is infinitely patient. Jesus is infinitely kind. Jesus is never ever envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. Jesus didn't and doesn't and will not insist on his own way. Jesus always rejoices with the truth. If you want to know what love is, if you want to see this, li this list lived out in a life, you look to Jesus. And especially as he comes and he takes on our human form, and he takes the death that we should have got for being unlovely and unloving people, for not loving God and not loving other people as we should, as we love ourselves. 
He takes that punishment that we deserve while we were against God. That is true love. See, Jesus shows us love in 4K HDR while the rest of us are walking around in black and white. This list perfectly captures what love is because it gives us an incredible picture of what Jesus has done for us. And so even before we move on to the last part of our passage, let me bring out a couple of points of application here. Come again and look at these verses, verses 4 to 7. Where are feelings of affection in this list? Love is warm feelings. It's not there. Often this is the measure that we want to use though. How do I know if I'm loving someone else? Well, I feel warmth and affection towards them. And we know that warmth and affection hopefully are good and right things to feel. If you're serving here at North Coast and you think, well, okay, I want to think, have I been loving the people I've been serving? Generally, the first thing that you'll go to is, do I feel warmth and affection for those people that I am serving? It's easy to go to our feelings, but Paul is calling us to something bigger here. Because love is not just a feeling that we feel. It's not just a warmth that we have towards other people. It's bigger than that. It's a mindset. It's a mindset that says, I will be patient. I will be kind. No matter on whether my feelings have turned up this day or not. I won't be envious or jealous or rude or boastful. Regardless of how warm and fuzzy I'm feeling on the inside. Love is takes work and that leads us to a second point of application there's no effortlessness on the list either and I think we kind of think this is often the way love should work especially when we're serving other people love is effortless so when we come and we serve we think well I'm gonna I'm gonna do this with joy and it's gonna be easy and it's gonna be all the time I'm just it's gonna carry me along and it'll all be fine no friends Patience takes work. Kindness takes work. How hard do you have to work to let go of a record of wrongs that other people have committed against you? These things take work. Love looks like work. And then you might ask them, well, how am I going to get the energy and the resolve? How am I going to actually pull up myself and get going for these things, to to live like this, to work like this, to love like this. And here we come again and again to the person of Jesus. Here we come day by day and give our attention to the one who loved us first, who gave up his life as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Because then we are moved to love. When we are loved by others, then we love in the way that they have loved us. So if we have been loved by Christ in this way, how could we not? How could we not love as Christ has first loved us? See, loving like this doesn't make me or you a better person. It doesn't get us into God's good books anymore. It doesn't mean that he's going to love us more because all of a sudden we're loving him. No, he's shown us infinite love in the cross of Christ. How can we not then, if we have that before us, live lives of love towards one another, have this kind of mindset? So firstly, you have love or you have nothing. Secondly, love looks a lot like work. But even then, hopefully there's a question that you're still asking. And that's why. Why is love so important? Why, out of all the things that Paul could have chosen, does he choose love? And this is the answer that he gives in verses 8 to 13. And here we see that love is all surpassing because love gives us a glimpse of heaven. Love gives us a glimpse of heaven. That's very easy to think that you can find a glimpse of heaven in lots of different places, isn't it? After all, this is exactly what the Corinthians did. They looked at people who were prophesying. They looked at people who were speaking in tongues. They thought... Wow, look at that. That shows heaven on earth, right? That shows God's heavenly 
uh, kingdom coming and working on earth, that's a glimpse of, glimpse of heaven. We do it here in WA as well too, don't we? You go for a walk along uh, the red road next to the beach down at Mullaloo or Kalaroo or wherever else, right? You look at the water, water unlike water anywhere else in the world. You look at what God has given us in creation and you think, I feel closer to God. This is kind of a glimpse of what heaven's going to be like. Or you stand and you sing as you're caught up with this music that moves you. And you think, this is what heaven's going to be like. I feel close to God. Or you sit under preaching that is powerful and cuts you to the heart. And you think, this must be a glimpse of heaven. And Paul says, no. No. Because what Paul does in this passage is he sets up two sides. There's an earth side and there's a heaven side. And the earth side finishes. That's going to stop. It's not here forever. Only heaven is eternal. And all the things that go into the earth side are there in verses 8 to 9. You can see them there. Prophecy, gone. Speaking in tongues, finished. The knowledge of God, done away with. When completeness comes, when heaven comes... What is in part, what's on earth, Paul says, will disappear. Those are the things on the earthly side. On the heavenly side, what is there? Verse 13, what are the things that remain? What are the things on the heaven side? These three remain, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest, Paul says of these, is love. This is what remains. This is what gives us a glimpse of heaven. In fact, if you look there at verse 11, you'll see that all of these other things, as impressive as they are, as spiritual as you might feel doing them or being part of them, they are like child's play compared to love. It's exactly what Paul says, right? I used to think like a child, I reasoned like a child, I spoke like a child. When I grew up, I put those things away. I didn't need them anymore. This passage is telling me that when we get to heaven, I'm going to be out of a job. You see, no one in heaven is going to need me to explain the Bible to them. Because they can just look and see Jesus. No one is going to need me to help them read the Bible and teach other people to read the Bible too. Because everyone will know the Lord. See, the ministry that I have now is not a glimpse of heaven. Because it's something we have now in our weakness because we aren't with Jesus now. We won't need it then. You won't need any powerful sermons in heaven. What will you have in heaven though? You'll have love. When we stand before the throne of Jesus, bowing down, submitting our lives to him perfectly, how are we going to treat other people? Patience, kindness, not envious or jealous or boastful or rude, rejoicing in the truth. Love is what gives us a glimpse of heaven. None of these other things. So what then? Well, January is rightly a time when we stop and reflect. Now, I think mostly these days, uh, people have become a bit cynical about uh, New Year's resolutions and we don't tend to do them anymore and that's okay but it is a time when we reflect about the year that's been and perhaps make some plans for the year that's coming and it's very easy when you're reviewing uh, to kind of look at what's happened in the year gone past to look at the ministries you've been involved in the things that you've done and to focus on actions and success to ask questions like how big was it how many times did this happen what was good? What was bad? What went right? What went wrong? How polished was it? All of these kind of questions. But Paul raises our vision bigger here and makes us ask a much more important question. Was there love in your service? Were you patient as you served? Were you kind as you served? Were you envious of the ministry of others as you served? Were you boastful in your heart as you served? Did you rejoice in the evil that happened to others as you served? 
Did you keep a record of wrongs as you served? These for Paul are far more important questions because you have love or you have nothing. What about the year ahead? As you plan, as you pray, as you think about what your service at this church and beyond might look like. Will you take this mindset of love? Will this be the thing that defines what you do in your service of Jesus and of other people? Will you keep coming back and looking at the cross of Christ, keeping your attention fixed on it so that you have what it takes then to go and love other people? Will you show this community and everyone else around you a true glimpse of heaven? Not by being impressive in your ministries, but by having love. Will you love as Christ has loved you? Because, Paul says, anything else is just aiming at child's play. Let me pray. Father, we confess that as we come to this passage that uh, we don't live up to this standard. We are not patient. We are not kind. Uh, we are not... Uh, we are people who are envious, people who are jealous, people who are boastful and rude. We do keep a record of wrongs. Father, forgive us. Thank you that through you we can come and know what true love is like. Thank you for Jesus and his death in our place. Please take that death and shape our lives by it so that we might love as you have loved us. And we ask this in his name. Amen.